event two years ago. It was January 2017. Uh, we celebrated the completion of the 11 volumes of the series against the Second Vatican Council, Eli Eli Lama Sabatani, written by Attila Sinka Guimaraes. That was two years ago. But now we're having what we're calling an event. Uh, and the title of this event is called Windows into the Counter-Revolution. And we called it this because the circle of our friends continues to grow, grow more and more here on the World Wide Web, phone calls, emails, addresses. And uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to, every couple of years, give them uh, windows into what we're doing. That's what we mean by windows into the counter-revolution. So we'll show a little bit today. We can't give everything, of course, but general ideas of what we've done, uh, what we are doing now, and what we plan to do in the future. And then hopefully, Our Lady willing, we will have another such event in two years. Um, and that's it. Now we get to the speeches. Our first speaker, uh, I have the great honor of calling him my friend. I met him some 40 years ago. He is unquestionably one of the distinguished leaders of the Catholic cause in the counter-revolution. Actually, I consider him something of a Roland in the Catholic cause, Roland the famous warrior of Charlemagne. Uh, he has honorably continued the counter-revolutionary fight started by Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira. Uh, I believe it was last year we had the honor as Americans that he became an American citizen. Oh. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, that meant he had to renounce any titles of nobility he had. And so he had to renounce any connection he had with Attila the Hun. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say. <laughs> so, that being said, uh, without further ado, allow me to introduce my good friend, Attila Sinke Guimaraes. Uh, Reverend Monsignor Patrick Perez. Uh, Reverend Father Paul Alvarez Norton, Reverend uh, Father Kevin Mannion, ladies and gentlemen, I was asked to give you a brief report on the activities of Tradition in Action in the last two years in a projection for the next two years uh, about uh, what we're doing. Uh, uh, after we finish the publication of the collection on Vatican II, and we have our celebration in the same room in January 2017, uh, uh, Mr. Michael Santamon that is here with us, he posed a series of questions uh, that uh, asked me to answer. So I did answer, and uh, then he, uh, suggested me to provide a glossary for the terms uh, that the, the normal reader is not familiar with in the collection. So also he suggested a biography of Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira, who was my mentor and the inspirer of this collection. But the result was this booklet, uh, Eli, Eli Lama Sabachthani, which became a sort of introduction for the collection and also a glossary for the readers to go when they have difficulty with some uh, uh, term. I left it to his inspiration to see if the, uh, we will have other small booklets on the other volumes of the collection or if this will be the only one. <coughs> Uh, during the, the event in 2017, a friend uh, 
suggest me to give a talk on each one of the volumes of the, that were, were published. He also suggests that I would uh, tape those uh, talks to introduce the readers to the volumes. So I thought that was a good idea, and I did. Do, I prepared the same talk for two, in 2018. At that time, a young lady, uh, Ms. Sawa Bashar, who is here, had joined TIA, and uh, besides her master degree in music, she revealed herself to be especially gifted to in producing videos. So she, with uh, the help of Mr. Santamon, are filming my talks and uh, uh, pr uh, making DVDs and Blu-rays. She also is putting this these videos in a YouTube channel that she created called Tradition in, Ed in Action Media. Uh, the, to this date, we have three videos that the TIA is giving gratis to those who are interested, and some of them are here for, you, for those who want to uh, have them. TIA only asks a, a donation, a voluntary donation, if possible. In November last year, I went to Brazil to meet some friends who are the admirers of our work in, here in the United States. Three of them decided to found a branch of TIA in Brazil and they start a website, which basically is the uh, translation of the articles we publish in our website here in the United States. Uh, the, their address is Tradition in Action do Brasil, Brazil with S, not with Z, dot com dot br. The goal of TIA do Brazil is to foster the counter-revolution in that country. Uh, following the uh, orientation of Professor Plinio Correia de Oliveira, who was a Brazilian. So they imagine, they st they struggling to uh, raise the same banner that they had before. And unfortunately, is no longer present in the picture. Uh, they, this group is struggling to find a house for work and uh, uh, meetings. And uh, for now, they are running their website from their homes. TIA website in the United States continues to be a, a dynamic presence on the internet for those who want to know the guidelines of the counter-revolution, the general lines of the counter-revolution. We post daily articles in about religious, political, cultural, and uh, general, uh, generally educational topics, which among other goals have uh, the idea of helping families in their homeschooling projects. Uh, our website has an audience that ranges from 4,000 to 7,000 visitors a day, depending on the month. On December the 24th, 2017, Christmas Eve, we lost a very good friend that was in our trenches for more than 20 years. I am speaking of Dr. Remy Amelunxen, here, uh, who uh, was with us since the first drafts of In the Murky Waters were translated to English. Was he that encouraged the publication of this book in English? He made all possible, all, everything that he could for the newly uh, founded Tradition in Action to do so. He had a very good death. Uh, having attended Mass in the morning and received communion. And uh, he was preparing to go to midnight Mass when he passed away. He was uh, 
He was hosting Dr. Marion Horvath and her, some members of her family. And uh, for Christmas, he opened his crib and was uh, uh, playing some uh, pieces in the piano when he felt some indisposition. Excused himself, went to his bed to rest and die peacefully there. Uh, it was thanks to the, the general's disposition, it's his will, that uh, TIA was able to buy a new house this last December, which will be the workplace for some of the ladies that are, support us and are working with us. Uh, I take advantage of this opportunity to publicly express our gratitude to him. <laughs> Regarding future projects, we embarked in a, a, a large one which uh, probably would take most of my, the, of, would take most of uh, the energy of my life until the end of my days. But uh, regarding this, I need to give a preliminary explanation. For about 22 years, I was the secretary of a selected commission of studies with the nine members and directed by Professor Plinio. The goal of this commission was to, to study the revolution under all its aspects and uh, to summarize its doctrine to denounce it. This denunciation would be in a form of a public manifesto. Hence, the name of the commission became MNF, the three first consonants of the word manifesto. The studies were made under the point of view of history uh, and sociology, anthropology, philosophy, theology, uh, art and culture in general. Obviously, as the revolution was analyzed, the counter-revolution also was defined in such a way that I believe we can, we can say that uh, the main guidelines of a new society and a new civilization were laid out. This commission met, had met three times a week since 1956, it's a long time ago, and uh, uh, with three members of TFP and the Dr. Plinio. In 1973, he expanded, invited three more, including myself. He, we start to, to, to record the whole meetings and uh, to transcribe them from tape to paper. As the years passed by, we had uh, uh, an amount of material that became co colossal. So we made a, uh, a work of indexes and summaries, and uh, we end with 45 volumes of synopsis of quite interesting topics. TIA's next project is to translate these 45 volumes into English and publish them. Uh, as the, the, the work starts with uh, Dr. Marian Horvath and uh, Ms. Sawa Bachar translated then from Portuguese into English, another problem starts is that the, the summaries are still in a raw form which would demand a lot of work to pass them from, uh, to make them in a language, in a form that can be presented to the public. Uh, we ask your prayers for this project with the, its multiple volumes to reach a good end. To give you an idea of the content, uh, I thought that could be of interest to uh, to let you know at least one of these topics, which gives idea of a future society, some guidelines for a future society. Thus, we, live, we will leave the 
somber field of denouncing progressivism to nourish a ray of hope for the reign of Mary. How should a future society be, according to the MNF? Today's society is based primarily on taking care of the, uh, the needs of the human body. We ask a government to uh, organize life so everyone has food, has clothes, has a reasonably comfortable house, as a health system, uh, health care system that works well, and fair salaries to allow these commodities, and uh, a good uh, police force, efficient police force to keep this organization work. It is a conception of society turned principally to, <coughs> to the needs of the human body. Uh, the way people gather in our society is to achieve these goals, these material goals. So a man has a bakery, he sells bread, he pays for the expenses of his building, his taxes, his employees, and then he saves money for his wants and needs. For example, he wants to buy a house for his family or another house for his daughter who is getting married. Uh, once uh, these material goals are achieved, he saves money to enjoy life. The peaceful enjoyment of life is the goal of the members of uh, our society. The MNF proposes a society for the future turned principally for the needs of the soul. We call this a society of souls. Someone could object that to seek principally for the good of the soul would lead uh, with uh, leaving the body in a secondary plan would lead for uh, would lead to a system of extreme poverty, since society always had a material con a concrete material goal. I respond saying that this is not true. Europe in the Middle Ages experienced an enormous uh, material development that allowed uh, uh, small cities to, to build magnificent cathedrals. Uh, what uh, allowed these small urban centers to do this wa was uh, reform in the system of uh, uh, plantation irrigation that multiply many times over the agricultural production they have until then. Uh, that system was invented by the Benedictine monks. As you know, the Benedictine monks uh, have uh, uh, as uh, motto, ora et labora, means uh, work, uh, pray and work. It is a religious orders, order that says the entire divine office, which takes uh, more than five hours of our time, not the liturgical hours, more than five hours a day. Uh, their goal is to continuously, continuous, continuously uh, praise God, which they call laus perennis, the, the continual prayer praising God. Well, those monks who have most of their time turned toward the glorifying God were the ones that uh, invented such an efficient system of production and plantation that uh, um, uh, was imitated by most of the landowners of the time and brought wealth for all of over Europe, all of Europe. The wealth returned to glorify God in the magnificent cathedrals that they built and that to, that to this day raised the admiration that everyone that visits Europe. So it's not true that to have a society turned principally for the good of the soul will, uh, will damage the, the material development of it. 
Our Lord told us to seek the reign of God and his justice, that everything else would be given in addition. Uh, what MNF proposes is an application of this uh, evangelical council. Uh, let me enter some doctrinal presuppositions for this society. God wants to be reflected in his creatures. Uh, when he created each one of us, he designed each of us to reflect one aspect of his person with a special light. This is what we call primordial light. When a person goes to heaven, he or she will shine eternally reflecting that perfection of God to others. But since God is most perfect, no single creature can reflect him sufficiently. So the, the, the persons who are called to reflect the same perfection of God should join to give a better idea of him. This they should group in in a, in a way that they can all together reflect this perfection. They, they, these groups, they, they make up families of souls, similar to families of bodies. These families of souls should uh, reflect this perfection of a God in a way similar to an orchestra. So in an orchestra, you have uh, uh, many different mu musical instruments that join together to, under the direction of maestro, to play a symphony in which each one, each instrument, plays its own part. Uh, the, the ensemble is more splendorous than each instrument playing alone. So also in a society, those persons that are called to reflect the same perfection of God should join and, uh, so to speak, play their own special symphony. How does God give vocations to men? Uh, some people believe that God is a kind of absent-minded artist that uh, uh, gives his vocations following an abstract plan in the air. This would be to imagine an unwise God which is absurd. God gives his vocations to attend to his glory on earth, that is to attend the, the, the highest reflections of himself on earth that are the Catholic Church and the Catholic civilization. When these institutions are healthy, he gives vocations to make them more perfect. When they are under attack, God gives his vocations to destroy the enemies of the church or these institutions, to defend them and to restore them. So he would be unwise if he would give vocations that would increase the apostates in the church or to increase the destruction of a civilization. Uh, this is a fal it's false to imagine such a scenario. God does not give vocations to uh, reinforce the army of his enemies, nor the, uh, the, the ranks of the fifth column of the enemy that has infiltrated the, uh, our camp. So when you say that in a society of souls, persons should uh, look for others with the same vocation, we are speaking primarily of uh, a fight, a union in a, co a common fight against enemies. This is the primordial light that governs all the natural gifts and talents we may have. What are the main problems today that remove people from God? It is a universal apostasy from the faith and from Catholic civilization based on the false notion of tolerance. 
uh, under the pretext of charity and mercy. Allegedly, we should tolerate every, every evil in name of charity. So homosexuality, feminism, the revolt of the youth against uh, their superiors, and free love, to name a few. True charity, however, is to create conditions for a person to save his soul. What people do today is to become com complicit with the evil, which is not charity. This general apostasy is the last step of a centuries-old movement called the revolution that has infiltrated the church is producing this. Consequently, the Catholic society of the future should be characterized by the opposite of this tolerance for evil. It must be defined for a reinforcement of militancy and a great vigilance over the vices that had led us to the present day apostasy. All the virtues should be practiced subordinated to this primordial light of militancy. So a future pope will only be a, a good pope if he places his pontificates under the light of combating the errors we are witnessing today. The emperor, the king, the ruler can only exercise their roles well if they fight the tolerance that uh, produce the completely decadence of society, the egalitarianism that uh, fed the revolt of the inferiors against superiors, and the, the, the flooding waves of vulgarity that made our society abandon almost everything that is solemn, sacred, and elevated. Thus, we have here the four elements that compose a mentality that should be, it should inspire that all the vocations to come, which are the militancy, the hierarchy, sacrality, and the purity. These elements must constitute the strong walls surrounding the holy city. Within these walls, the bishop will be free to shepherd his flock, to form his clergy, and to prepare his seminarians. The religious orders will develop each one seeking the glory of God according to their own vocations. The temporal governor, the count, the noble, will look for the best organic means to achieve the common good live in peace and make the social order progress. The architect will build his buildings, his edifices following these principles. The artist will carve his statues and the musician will compose his hymns and songs under the strong influence of militancy, hierarchy, sacrality, and purity. All these religious and social developments can only be achieved under the supernatural patronage of the queen of angels and men, the queen of uh, heaven or earth, the, holy, uh, the most holy Virgin Mary. These are the, element, the reasons why we fight, we hope and pray for the complete destruction of the revolution and the implantation of the reign of Mary. Tradition in action is nothing but a small tool exercising its role to achieve this elevated goal. Thank you.